back from Ghana, living there for several years uh, as uh, the ambassador to uh, to to the Danish ambassador to Ghana. Uh, also, uh, so clearly, also has a lot of experience, understanding of the dynamics in 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 Ghana. She is here not, I think, in an official capacity, but will be speaking to uh, dynamics and issues in in Ghana, and specifically looking at the COVID the consequences, COVID nineteen, and what actually happened around the outbreak of COVID-19, specifically in Ghana. So I think there are a lot of stories coming out of Ghana, of course. We know Ghana as this place in West Africa that is, a very, that is very stable, that is democratic, uh, in a region that has experienced a lot of conflict. There's always a lot of papers, including some that I have been uh, uh, writing as well, have started out with this, uh, with this story. But of course, stability in Ghana is not a given, and there are a lot of indications of tensions as well in Ghana, of course. Um, one of the big trends, and I know that uh, Kwesi will be talking about, it, are these uh, political vigilante groups that are emerging in, in Accra around the political parties that are setting up security groups of their own because they do, they do not necessarily sort of uh, trust the, the, the Ghana police service, which of course is an indication of a security system that is not fully trusted by all parties to, 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 the, to, the, to the election. Uh, there is also an increasing use of military for internal operations, and both, of course, these political vigilantes and also in uh, the use of military for internal operations are indications of some tension that is arising. And I think Kwesi will definitely be uh, sort of explaining to us what all this means. Um, recently, there has also been secessionist uh, tendency or sort of uh, attempts in uh, in Western Ghana, Togoland, which of course speaks to sort of general dynamics in West Africa currently ab around ethnic identity. And I think that is also a rising issue, not just in Ghana, but in West Africa. And we see it sort of how it materializes, how it comes to fruition in, in, in Togoland, in, in Western Ghana, uh, which I know that Kwesi will also speak to. <laughs> and then, of course, we have COVID-19. And I think none of us really understand the, the implications of COVID-19 for Ghana uh, or indeed the world. Uh, but luckily, we have somebody here uh, who will uh, discuss this with us and explain to us some of the some of the d developments within Ghana uh, as a consequence of the outbreak of COVID-19. And that will be Tove. Um I think I'll stop here and then uh, invite to the stage Kwesi uh, to start out. We have um, 20 f 25 minutes uh, for, for Kwesi to talk and then followed by Tove who will speak for the same amount of time and then we have a little bit of a Q&A that I will facilitate and then after that we have a drink or two in, in, the, uh, uh, in front of the, uh, of the auditorium. So Kwesi, please. So, whatever you want. What, what do you prefer? You want this? Uh, I hear you need to put it on. <laughs> yeah. So maybe put that on. He's a pro, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me thank Peter very much, and uh, certainly also Tove. Um, it took quite a bit of time to get me here. That I can assure you, uh, in the days of COVID. Um, so Peter has given me a rather tall order this afternoon to talk about politics, security, and the December 2020 elections. So in this presentation, I want to do a couple of things in my 25 minutes of glory. Um, First, I want to make a couple of points. That politics in Ghana is driven by suspicion, by mistrust, by anger, by bitterness, but more importantly, by the allure of access to the public peace. Now, because of that, we need to contextualize seemingly technical interventions that in other parts of the world will be fairly routine, will not engender violence, and people can basically just walk in and, and get it done. So I will speak a little bit about this drive 
for a, a new voters register in Ghana. The responses from the Coalition of Domestic Observers and talk about a rather disturbing phenomenon that threatens Ghana's very existence. The establishment, recruitment, training, funding, and protection of the groups that we term as vigilantes. And the manner in which violence or political violence has become a currency in the Fourth Republic. But, but of course, I'd want to discuss also specific interventions, three mutually reinforcing interventions that seeks to bring under control the political violence. My argument is very simple. We need to dissociate the rhetoric of intervening and bringing politically motivated violence under control and the actual operational actions taken by the state. Then, as Peter said, the idea of Ghana as a unitary state has been accepted for the past 63 or so years. Throughout that period, there's been some contentions around whether the processes that allowed a certain aspect of Ghana or the new Ghana to be established has been accepted by people. The state's unwillingness to discuss, to listen, has eventually resulted in what West Africans are best known for, a politically violent response to the state's recalcitrance. And then I'll make a couple of concluding remarks. In Ghana, political campaigning is a constant you know, action undertaken by political parties. So since the December 2016 e elections, Ghana's politics has been characterized by mistrust, suspicion, and an increasingly acrimonious, rhetorically violent environment that is totally inconducive to playing you know, democratic uh, politics. But especially in an ethnically diverse country. But also that since 2012, there have been narratives around the re register that is used for the actual voting. There has been a perception that the voter register is over bloated and there's a very unfortunate discursive analysis that that bloating has come about because of people who have infiltrated the country and then to have uh, registered. Precisely because of the tensions around the register, the Electoral Commission had to amend the legislative framework that then allowed it to start a process of establishing a new voters uh, register. That process was completed early part of this year, and in mid-June thereabouts, the registration process started. Now, one would have thought that we would have a clear idea of how many people we thought that we wanted to register. I mean, this is science and not voodoo. So the EC itself argued that it expected to register around 15 million people. By the time the registration was finished, the EC had registered 16.9 uh, million people, close to 2 million extra names on, on, on the new register. So it creates a certain concern about the accounting base upon which there were these suspicions about a bloated uh, re uh, register. Now, precisely because of the conditions under which the registration took place. Specific interventions had to be done to ensure that the process generated trust. So amongst them was a conversation around the registration kit 
a biometric a bio, a biometric voters register, the construction of new data centers, methodologies for the registration, COVID-19 um, measures, and then, of course, the criteria for eligibility. So let me break down some of the f uh, figures that the Electoral Commission has finally managed to put out. Interestingly enough, out of the 16.9 million people, males re represent only 48.2% and females 51.7%. One would have thought there were considerably more women on the voters register, there will be a much more nuanced, sophisticated narrative around the contributions of women to our development and to our, to our democratic growth. Unfortunately, when the major opposition party chose a woman, a professor, a well-known scholar as its running mate, opposition party leaders decided not to target her, her history and her contributions and her career achievements, but rather to target her, her her gender, which I think is most un unfortunate. After the registration process, there, there, there is supposed to be an exhibition of the register as a method to garner trust and transparency. In showing that new register with the 16.9 million names, it was discovered that quite a substantial number of people could not find their names on the register, and then certainly, of course, some people could not also uh, register. So the commission is considering a supplementary registration to target three categories of people. A, those who were outside Ghana and couldn't travel because of the COVID restrictions. B, those who had traveled into Ghana for some reason or the other, but had a 14-day quarantine period and couldn't uh, register. And finally, the category of those who actually registered but could not find their names on the exhibited uh, register. So what does the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers think about the process? Well, it became very clear that the levels and quality of public education around the, the registration pr uh, process was not as good as it ought to be. That there was security presence in almost 80% of all the registration you know, centers. And that gives you the impression of how we need to negotiate the tense issues, potentially controversial issues, because the real question then becomes, I mean, I'm going to register, I have my national ID card, I have my passport, why the need for an armed you know, police officer? Disturbingly, in almost every single registration center, there was a party agent, both the ruling government and then the opposition party, that sought to ask people who had registered, where do you live? What is your telephone number? Can I call you later on? Those types of intimidatory tactics were not uh, helpful. In terms of the COVID-related preparations, hand-washing facilities were available in almost all the registration centers. All registration centers were fairly airy enough and spacious enough for people actually to practice uh, uh, social uh, distancing. That did not happen in most of the cases. For those who follow the Ghana case, you may have read or heard about the violence that took place. And once more, I want to e emphasize this. Registering to vote is a simple technical, transparent process. 
And the process was such that all those above 50 years were given special places where they could basically just walk in and register. It took me three and a half minutes to register for myself. That then raises questions about why and how in certain instances the violence did take place. And herein comes the issues around politically motivated violence and those who are recruited, trained, and f encouraged, funded, protected to undertake these types of violence. And I argue that over the past 12 or so years, this phenomenon of vigilantism is beginning to threaten Ghana's very existence. These are groups of both men and women, but primarily men, who provide law enforcement roles, they provide conflict resolution services, but are also involved in all kinds of businesses. We are beginning to see a franchising of their use of violence to attain particular ends. But I want to focus on three key things. One relates to the functional utility of violence in politics. Consistently in the Fourth Republic of Ghana, starting from 1992, we are seeing a dramatic escalation of the use of violence during every single election, but even more crucially during by elections. Violence in society distorts societal hierarchies and creates avenues for those who perpetrate crimes to be protected and to get away with it. But we're also beginning to see a collusion between vigilante groups, organized you know, criminal groups in the exploitation of timber, charcoal, gold, and in small arms. I'll come to the next section talking about the legislation and processes to control these groups. But in the last six months, across Ghana, we've seen the establishment of, of almost 12 or 13 new groups and taking some of the most fascinating names on the Ghanaian political uh, landscape. Okada boys, parliamentarians, capitalists, Babga, Shaga, uh, Shaka, Kuga, country forces, and Jamaica boys. These groups routinely perform as I've said earlier on, law enforcement functions. They are engaged in illegal mining, retrieve stolen goods, especially motorbikes, and have alliances both with criminal groups, but routinely funded and equipped by politicians. But let me highlight why this is very dangerous for Ghana. And I want to talk about f five small things. One is the location of the country I I I itself. My argument is very you know, simple. As we move, or as the country moves between now and December 7th, so Ghana has just about eight weeks prior to the ele elections, all its contiguous states are fairly unstable. Burkina Faso to the north, La Côte d'Ivoire, and Togo. There is no doubt in my mind at all that any consistent instability over time resulting from violent activities before, during, and after the e elections will be uh, exploited. So the geography is very Im Im important. The second is language. The misuse of ethnic, gender, you know, uh, classifications. The deliberate manipulative use of these things. Language employed in political messaging in Ghana is often abusive, mi misogynistic, antisocial, and threatening. Since March, when the COVID situation became much serious in, in Ghana, we have seen an increase in the indecent use of l uh, language, the role of cyber bullies and vigilantes, paid to threaten and abuse critics. But we are also seeing you know, politically partisan cyber bullies unleashing deliberate emotional and psychological attacks 
on independent critical uh, voices. Now, when language is used and abused in particular ways, it, it, it becomes very threatening, it becomes a weapon of psychological and political intimidation, and since political discourses determine how language is utilized, it also becomes an instrument for, for manipulating the electorate by politicians. Such processes, I argue, contribute to the normalization of anger and violence as part of routine political uh, discourse. S second, any routine look at you know, popular websites in Ghana will show an increase in abusive language, hate speech, and then the defamation. The third point relates to the role of the uniformed services. And I think uh, Peter has mentioned that in uh, passing. And I want to give two examples in which particularly the Ghana Police Service that under existing law has the mandate to protect lives and property. During the voter registration exercise, a sitting minister of state woke up, took a gun, went to a registration center and fired around. We argued as civil society very strongly for her to be dismissed from cabinet or for her at least to be prosecuted. Since July, the police have not managed to prosecute her. S the National Peace Council, three days ago, formally requested the police service to make their investigations public. 10 days ago, vehicles of the Ghana Police Service were seen transporting supporters of the incumbent government to a public uh, rally. Requests have been made to the police service to present a report on, on, on it. The Inspector General of Police has promised. But it doesn't take you 10 days with a visible video, with a car number very clear for a whole police service, close to 35,000 people to issue a report as to why its logistics are being uh, misused. That does not generate the confidence, the trust about the independence and capacity of the police service to de deliver on what we expected to deliver. In January last year, there was a by e election. To cut a long story short, that election became so violent, members of parliament were beaten, ballot boxes destroyed, and new forms of security operatives shown to the people of Ghana. The subsequent concern by the public led His Excellency the President during the State of the Nation's address to give two promises. One, to establish a dedicated commission to look into the violence, and failing that, to institute legislation that punishes uh, political uh, violence. Subsequent to these two interventions, the National Peace Council was authorized to start what the government then termed as a disbandment process. So on the surface, very encouraging developments. So let me speak about the three processes very briefly. The National Peace Council started a negotiation process, and that is a whole story by, by I I itself. That negotiation process res resulted in two specific um, outcomes. One was the development of a roadmap that sought 
to encourage the political parties to take necessary steps to ensure that their members refrain from vigilante activities, cooperate with law enforcement agencies, commit to the political code of conduct, and finally, to sensitize and educate their members of on, on the dangers. B, the two major political parties signed on to a code of conduct that specifies their behavior relating to the actions of their vigilante groups, prohibit the ownership, hiring, utilization of such groups, and finally to cooperate with state agencies. The president then sent to parliament a vigilantism and related offenses act last year. It basically stipulated for the mandatory prohibition of uh, vigilantism in all its forms. Now, from these two processes, it's quite clear that there's an acceptance by the state, its uh, elites and key actors that political vigilantism is a problem. The real issue is how to move from the rhetoric of disbandment to the operational hands-on approach of actually saying we are not going to use these vigilantes to get a job done for us. To be able to do that, the, the government then established a specific commission, the ML Short Core mission, to do two things, amongst others. To make a faithful and impartial inquiry into the circumstances of and establish the facts leading to events and associated you know, violence that occurred in 2019, but more importantly, to identify any person responsible for or who has been involved in the events associated with the violence. So here on the rhetorical side, we see this desire, this aspiration to come to grips with a canker that is beginning to pose a, an existential threat to Ghana. The commission, and I was quite happy to be invited to appear before the commission, in this final report concluded, amongst other things, that it finds th that there is, a, a, that there is a, a, a reality of militia groups, either formed by uh, political parties or uh, uh, otherwise, that they are also funded by these uh, political parties or by prominent people within the parties. It concluded, at a minimum, their existence is condoned by the two leading political parties for whom vigilante services are performed from time to time. The government, in response to this report by its own commission of inquiry, argued, quote, the commission failed to make a full, faithful, and impartial inquiry into the circumstances of and establish the facts leading to the events associated with violence. For this reason, government has rejected most of the recommendations of the report. Now, the signal is very clear that we appreciate the violence that you perform and we look forward to this violence towards election 2020. Now, this has led to quite a bit of conversation in, in Ghana. I can see Peter has gotten up, so I'll spend the next five minutes to end. Just a little under a month ago, the conversations post-1956 about how a plebiscite took place, the results leading to the Transvolta Togoland being added to Ghana eventually came to a head. A group calling itself the Homeland Steady Foundation, together with two other groups, Western Togoland Restoration Front, and People's Liberation Council, who have been agitating for secession, eventually decided to use armed violence. 
taking into consideration the already existing tensions that characterize the voter registration, the role of vigilantes, the deployment of troops to respond to this coordinated attack on state institutions has led to even more tensions between the political parties and amongst different groups. So Peter, uh, let me end before you tell me to sit down. The elections two months away have become even more intense this year and at different uh, levels. Both the current president and the former president have defeated each other once at the pools. So apart from a party political contestation, this is about two strong men who don't want to lose the opportunity. As a result, the contest has become more personalized, the campaigns characterized by suspicion, mistrust, and there's growing uncertainty about the neutrality of, of those who need to protect the ballot box amidst wild and false you know, promises being made by the parties. Let me conclude by specifically looking at the security preparations. Because my point is very simple. It is the security agencies who will eventually maintain national stability if and when danger looms. And the possibility of danger is very o o obvious. One, during the voter registration exercises, the violence that we saw across the country were unnecessary. Two, the use and the presence of small arms and the role of the vigilantes even gives cause for more concern. Number three, atrocities that have taken place by vigilantes that have gone unpunished creates an indication of a, of a culture of violence and a culture of, of impunity. This has resulted in the opposition party sending clear uh, signals that they are willing and prepared to take their resistance onto the streets. Furthermore, new groups are being founded, and it is my considered opinion that if uncontrolled, they are bound to be clashes as we head towards the elections. The security agencies are already o overstretched and capacity to contain such crisis will be difficult. Hopefully all is not doom and gloom. <coughs> Two suggestions. One, it will be advisable to leave security on election day only for the recognized statutory security forces and not the vigilante groups. Party vigilante groups have no business going near the ballot boxes and going near the election uh, centers. And Ghana has more than enough security agencies to be able to do that. However, any infiltration of these statutory security groups by party structures will lead to resistance from parties and civil society that in the long run will overwhelm national security. So as you look towards the elections in December, I think be critical, but also be hopeful. We are hopeful, but we do recognize that it's going to be a difficult uh, process. Thank you. And thank you very much, Squeezy, for that uh, interesting insight into some of the complexities of Ghana leading up to the elections. And uh, let's hope, to quote you, it's not all doom and gloom, and that we will see a peaceful election to the greatest degree possible. Tove, please, please join me here. And uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say about COVID-19 and its consequences in Ghana, among other things. Thank you. Seems that I already need some technical assistance here. Do I do so it? No, it's it works. Yeah, okay. Not from me. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Uh, and talking about technical challenges, I understand that we're not streaming. I think there was some technical I issues. Okay, I, I've just got a message that okay. people cannot access it. Okay. Anyways, that's, well, you're here, so uh, <laughs> it's not your problem. Um, thanks a lot for inviting me for this. As uh, Peter just said, um, I was the ambassador of Denmark to uh, to Ghana until a month ago. I was there in for five years, enjoyed it a lot, but then uh, decided that after the end of my posting uh, by by first September, I would uh, like to to use the occasion to have a sabbatical year. So, uh, which I'm really enjoying, but uh, but whenever somebody's talking about Ghana, then of course I've, I've become curious and interested, and uh, and and I'm very happy that uh, I have the possibility uh, to uh, to participate today. We've agreed that I should say a few words, or I'm in the way, uh, about the uh, COVID crisis in in Ghana, and I'll just say uh, f start out by saying something about the government's response, which was very immediate and bold. Uh, and I think they deserve praise for that. Also, the results in, in terms of limiting the number of COVID uh, cases, the economic consequences of COVID, and then usually when we're talking about individuals uh, who, who are uh, getting COVID, we're talking about some underlying causes which can uh, aggravate the situation. I think we have here uh, for the country as such both some underlying health issues, some economic issues and also political issues and I'll I'll um, I'll deal with each of these uh, hopefully oh this was the one I should use hopefully not no well, uh, the other way <laughs> here we go yeah the responses uh, by the government after the first cases of covid uh, was uh, w confirmed that was on the 12th of March, so a bit later than in, in Europe at least uh, and, and other countries. But the government responded immediately. There were uh, travel restrictions uh, in place already on 15th March, a few days later only. Uh, and a complete closing of the borders uh, as of the 22nd of March. That gave us, of course, in the embassy a lot of headache trying to send Danes home, as you've seen from all other countries. You've probably been trapped, some of you also. Uh, in far away places where you needed the embassy's assistance. But, uh, but Ghana was very firm uh, and closed its, its borders uh, and they remained closed until uh, early September. So that, that was longer than for many other countries. Also closing of education institutions, which are still closed. It's only in, in uh, January they are expected to open again. Ban on services in churches and mosques uh, that was lifted again in, in late July, early uh, August, gradually lifted. Uh, most things are functioning now again, apart from the education institutions, uh, the, the borders are open. And then mo maybe most importantly, a partial lockdown of uh, both uh, Accra and the second largest city, uh, Kumasi, from 30 March and three weeks until the 20th of April. It's compulsory to wear face masks, uh, and that, that remains uh, still. The government was very fast to start uh, building up the testing capacity. Uh, it, it is actually much better in Ghana than in many other countries. I don't think Denmark can boast particularly of, of, uh, of our support, because many others have supported also, but Gucci Hospital has <laughs> received a lot of Danish uh, funding over the years. Uh, and, and they turned out to be very fast to have a very good and reliable testing capacity, which was then further expanded. There's been recently some doubts about f the way the testing is taking place, because uh, suddenly uh, the, the testing was reduced a lot, and, and at the same time there were some backlogs, and it was not really clear whether they were counted in the statistics and so on, the usual story that we're hearing from so many other countries. But generally, it's been possible to go and have a test done and also to, to trust the result. Treatment facilities, initially they had only six beds um, available for, for COVID patients, but, but it was also a very rapid expansion of the, uh, test, uh, of the treatment facilities. So in all regions now there are um, treatment facilities and quarantine uh, system was set up. And I, it's not, of course, uh, bulletproof and of course there were a lot of of, uh, of mistakes happening, things that didn't work. It was also possible since it's Ghana. 
to pay to avoid coming uh, going to quarantine and all this, of course. But but by and large, they've they really made an effort to expand all this. The personal protective equipment was missing, and I think we know that very well from Denmark also, that the uh, frontline health staff were suffering initially a lot because they didn't have any protective um, wear. It they started locally producing it and it became better. It's not perfect, but but much better. Then on ventilators, which was a much discussed issue in, in Europe, um, we had countries such as Italy and Spain and others who, who really missed uh, ventilators. Ghana have had more than they needed. Uh, 200 ventilators in Ghana, which is the second largest per population in Africa. And it turned out that the um, pandemic was giving more mild symptoms in Ghana than, than in Europe. Um, this particular la variety that, that uh, came to Ghana was, was more mild, apparently. So, uh, so, so far, uh, it has been possible to, uh, to cope, uh, and there's even been an excess capacity of, of, of ventilators, it appears. We have heard cases of, of people who, uh, who missed ventilators after they, had they were admitted to hospitals, but it seemed to be more a matter of not really organizing it well and, and, and distributing them well, not, not uh, missing the number of, of uh, ventilators required. So far, uh, there's been uh, 47,000 confirmed cases, uh, currently only 466 active cases and 300 deaths. You can always argue that it's 300 too many. You can always al also question, is it really true? What about all those who have tuberculosis where they count it as TB cases instead of, uh, of COVID and so on? But overall, it, it, it it uh, tallies with what we hear from people. It's not so that the people that we've been talking to uh, since March have told uh, abundant stories about uh, relatives or friends who had COVID and couldn't be treated and so on. It is the impression that it has not been as bad as, as we all thought when it started. Um, mild symptoms, as I said, it's also been very much concentrated on Accra and Kumasi. In, uh, in the northern regions, currently, they claim that they don't have a single case. That sounds too good to be true, but at least it's, it's not a lot. Uh, and also in other regions, uh, they say that COVID is no, no longer a problem uh, for them. The capacity of the health system um, seems to have kept up. We were skeptical. We've been working with, uh, with Ghana cooperating in the health sector for, for 23 years. Uh, and, and based on our uh, knowledge about the health sector, then, then we found it difficult to, to believe. But, but at least there was never a complete breakout, breakdown. Um, it seems that the experience of learning from the Ebola epidemic, or epidemic maybe we should call it, um, in, in 2014 was of some help. At least uh, the, uh, the ability or the understanding of the importance of responding very fast, not sit sit down, establish uh, committees to reflect about things, but just act. Uh, and this was very much what the government did. Where there wasn't much learning was on having a preparedness uh, system so that uh, the protective uh, equipment was available and systems were laid out for, for how to, uh, to organize the, uh, uh, the, the way of dealing with it. All this didn't exist. And there you could say that having had such an epidemic in, in the neighboring countries, not in Ghana, but Ga Ghana was very much involved. Ghanaian doctors were very much involved in, in, in the three countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea Conakry. So recently, then you would maybe have thought of uh, preparing yourself for, for uh, something similar in the future. That had not happened. And, and they had to start from scratch. But then again, if you look at the Danish preparedness system, it wasn't that impressive either. So, uh, so mayb maybe we shouldn't we shouldn't blame a country such as Ghana for th for that. Um, so, we were extremely worried when it started in March, and and it was an argument we used when we spoke to all the Danes, called up each Dane and said, "Go back to Denmark. We are very worried that this will develop into something very bad, and the, c the health system will not be able to cope." That situation that we were fearing all the time, and that the government were fearing also, never happened. But then the economic consequences uh, of uh, 
of, of the pandemic in, in Ghana. Ghana was the first country to lift a lockdown. There's been lockdowns in a number of other countries, some are still ongoing, but already after three weeks, the president decided that, uh, that it trading, looking at the balance of, of, uh, of, of arguments for protecting health versus protecting the economy and not least avoiding violence. I think the avoiding violence argument was maybe the main argument uh, in, in their considerations. Already at that time, there were um, uh, very violent confrontations in Nigeria and South Africa, also in Kenya. So it, there was ample evidence of what could be the result if people in densely populated uh, areas, slum areas in Accra and Kumasi were, were confined to, uh, to one room and couldn't go out and provide for their families. These people live from day to day. Uh, it's the only possibility of, of earning an income that's go out and sell the five tomatoes or whatever, uh, which is possible during that day. Uh, and, and if they cannot go out, then uh, if there will this, this situation will be boiling very soon. So I think it was a wise decision by uh, the president at the time. It was very much criticized, of course, by health sector specialists, because whenever you're opening, uh, we have exactly the same discussion in Denmark, you'll see uh, an upsurge in the number of, of cases soon after. The growth rate has been seriously, seriously affected. Uh, IMF had predicted 7.5%. It should have been not a comma, but 7.5% uh, in 2020, and assessments are now between 1% or 1.5% for, for 2020. And it is likely to remain difficult for a number of years to come. The Minister of Finance says two to three years um, will, uh, at least, uh, Ghana will be affected of, of the crisis. It's mainly been the uh, the shortfall fall in uh, in oil prices that has uh, hit Ghana. To some extent, ingre increasing uh, gold prices have have made up for it, but not enough. Uh, Temaport has been functioning all the time, so it's been possible to get goods in all the time. But uh, especially the fact that China was so hard hit has met that their export has gone down and and the uh, the cargo uh, has been of, of normal tourist sector uh, had yeah the tourist sector <laughs> um, they had experienced their first success ever uh, over the christmas of 2019 the government had uh, a campaign called um, um, crazy help me uh, year of the return, <laughs> the year of the return, <laughs> it was everywhere, so how could I forget? Uh, where Afro-Americans were invited back to Ghana to visit the old slave fortresses and also to enjoy the, the, uh, the culture uh, of Ghana in, in, in all its expressions. And it became such a success. It was impossible to book a hotel in, in Accra over uh, late November and all December. Um, and, and hotel managers were celebrating. Uh, it was impossible to move around in, Ac in Accra even more than usual. It, 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 the traffic was was completely jammed, uh, and there were so many of these uh, celebrities from the U.S. who were who were tweeting and telling about uh, the wonders of Ghana, and everybody else then wa wa wanted to follow their path. And it collapsed overnight, of course, when it wasn't possible to travel into Ghana. It, the expectation was that that they had built a platform, and now the tourism should really generate a lot of income. But maybe even worse, uh, the informal sector, as I mentioned, people who live from day to day, who uh, are unable to have savings and, and uh, plan ahead, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, all these have been suffering a lot. And some of them just collapsed, and, and it'll be difficult for them to, uh, to build it again. The government, like in most other countries, uh, launched a series of initiatives to support uh, the private sector. Uh, re reductions of power bills and uh, water bills and tax delays and uh, all these things. The challenge is, of course, to reach those who need it most. Uh, the informal sector, again, people in remote rural areas and so on. Um, how do you identify them? How do you assess their needs and so on? Uh, I don't think anybody has a clear picture of where all these uh, support money went. If we move to the uh, underlying conditions, 
then uh, there were some some underlying health issues. Uh, and as, as, as I said, we have been uh, uh, cooperating Denmark and Ghana on in the health sector for, for very many years. We ended our support in 2016 as part of the general phasing out of Danish support to Ghana. Um, and some of the key indicators such as maternity and child mortality uh, are very poor for Ghana and, and they do not correspond to, to the general uh, economic level of the country. It's, it's hard to understand that it's, it's, it's still so difficult to, uh, to uh, improve these very basic uh, health indicators. There is a heavy burden of traditional diseases. Many people have tuberculosis, not so many have HIV, but it exists. Respiratory diseases, very common. Uh, and of course, combina combination of this and uh, COVID is, is dangerous. But, but uh, also to understand the ability of the health sector system to cope with both all these traditional diseases and a new pandemic. This was what we feared, at least initially, that, that this can go very, very wrong. Um, the priority given to the health sector is lower in Ghana than in most other countries. It's actually surprising to look at the share of health in, in government expenditures and see that countries such as Liberia and Togo and Benin and all these countries, they're giving more, relatively speaking, than Ghana. Ghana could definitely do much more uh, on, on prioritizing health. And then a challenge that drove us almost mad when we were <laughs> in this cooperation. It's so hard to get the funds out of Accra and out to the regions and out to the districts and especially to the, the, the tip compounds, the uh, health, sec um, health clinics in the rural areas. We were almost literally pushing the money out and everything came late. Um, and and <laughs> we had the... the Devastating, I'd say, disappointment to see that after we focused on maternity and child uh, mortality and, and efforts to bring that down, it increased during the last two years of our health sector cooperation. And we think that the main reason was that the money never reached where they were needed. So, th so that's, that's uh, a, a major problem in the health uh, system. Ghana repeatedly receives uh, criticism from uh, even from IMF for not spending no enough on health. Then that gives an indication of how bad it is. Uh, and the UN Special uh, Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty was in Ghana in, uh, in late 2018 and really criticized not uh, the, the, the governments not being able to and willing to. Uh, spend enough on health. Underlying economic conditions or issues, Ghana is deeply indebted. Um, the debt corresponds to 64% of GDP and before the COVID pandemic, 40% of government incomes were used on for debt service and it's expected that it'll be 50% of government uh, incomes this year. It's huge and it's, it's almost difficult to imagine how to, to, uh, to cover all the other necessary expenditures if you're constantly paying back your, your loans and, and, and uh, interest rates. These substantial loans were not taken recently. It, they've been taken over very many years and especially in election years. It's it's been a clear pattern that uh, debt goes up in election years. It never goes down, but then <laughs> maybe, <laughs> and then goes up next time, and so on. Um, and there's been limited accountability after elections, so it's not really clear where these funds have always gone. Uh, what what is clear is that they have not been used to to support structural transformation of the economy. There's there's not been uh, a, a limitation of the dependency on, on uh, natural resources and so on, and the building up of uh, industries and uh, so on. So there's been a huge problem. I know it's n in and very much discussed and, and in my present capacity on uh, sabbatical leave, I, I shouldn't uh, discuss that, whether or not uh, there should be uh, uh, delays of repayment or even uh, uh, cancellation of debts for a country such as Ghana. The only thing I'd say is that it did not come with the COVID. It was definitely there already and, and it has no uh, link to uh, trying to improve the health situation or, or the economic situation of the country. It was there. And then Ghana could have done a lot more to, uh, to raise uh, tax revenues. It's 
it's uh, there's probably virtually no property tax being paid. There's a multitude of tax exemptions, and especially the uh, custom fees are only a fraction of what could be collected. Again, Danita has been involved in uh, in cooperation on the tax system, and we ran screamingly away. Um, there was not an interest really to address the the key challenges in the system. We were focusing on on, on custom fees, um, and it never worked. But there's there's a huge potential. Ghana is a rich country. Very many people are wealthy. Uh, the money is there. It's a matter of addressing some of these more uh, structural challenges. And then the underlying political issues. Ghana received extensive COVID-19 support from, from very, very many international uh, partners, including, for instance, uh, uh, EU, 87 million euro in the form of general budget support uh, without any indicators or a monitoring system. Uh, it's without requesting this to be paid in tranches. It's been a one-off one payment. The EU ambassador uh, is proudly saying that uh, we're paying this without any strings as good partners. Uh, we have had heated discussions in, in uh, the EU group and without going to details. Now it helps a bit that we're not streaming. So <laughs> I can... <laughs> <laughs> Um, we were of the view that it would be important to link such huge payments also to some monitoring to ensure that these uh, uh, big big amounts were were used for uh, for the intention uh, of of helping the health sector system and supporting the uh, strategic parts of the economy and not least ease the suffering of the poorest. Um, but. Uh, but there was not a general consensus on that. Others, IMF uh, has provided a credit of 1 mil billion US dollar. World Bank has given 300 million US dollars. African Development Bank has supported also. So it, it is quite significant amounts. And if it had not been in an election year, then an, uh, an emergency like uh, an earthquake or a pandemic and so on, we, w we would probably have agreed, yeah, yes, pay first and then we'll deal with all the uh, accountability uh, later. But it is a special thing to pay such huge amounts in an election year, uh, knowing the track record of how money has been spent in all the other uh, election years. So all international partners have, have faced this dilemma of of uh, showing themselves to be good partners in, in, in uh, during one of the worst crises in, in, in the country, or insisting on the principles of good governance, accountability, and uh, sorry, we would like to know <laughs> exactly where you're going to, sp to spend this money and, and can we see the accounts. Uh, but, but as the overall pattern is that, that, uh, that the majority of, of uh, these uh, international actors have wanted to be the good partner who just paid out. This is also touching on the way elections are funded, and, and uh, Kwesit spoke about it, that, that uh, it's difficult to become elected, or it's impossible to become elected, unless there's a lot of money involved, where you're paying people who you are, ne who are you then depend on uh, for their support in the future, uh, and, and you have to, in a way, pay back uh, to, to all these people who have supported the election campaign. And uh, with a lot of money coming flowing into the country in a year where so much of the election processes are monetized and, and depend on money flows, paying somebody to support, um, it it's not documented. We we don't know exactly what happened to to the money that came in this year, but we we can have our fears about uh, whether it's all been directed to uh, to uh, the carpenter in the informal sector who really needed it to get his uh, enterprise going. Um, one particular concern is that the auditor general, who uh, used to be a very vocal um person with a lot of integrity and who were were relentlessly pursuing cases and publishing them telling about uh, wh whenever public funds had had been uh, misused 
He was silenced in, in a very untraditional move in July when the president uh, instructed him to go on holiday. They had counted his number of holidays, found out that he had taken only 14 days holidays uh, since he took office in, in early 2017. And as the good employer the government was, uh, <laughs> it thought that it was important that he got some rest. And that rest was, well, all the time to the election and a few months more. So he can start again working in March. He, he has challenged this decision and the International Organization of, of uh, Auditor Generals have, have challenged it and the African uh, Organization of Auditor Generals have challenged it. And it's been a major debate, but so far he's out of office. Uh, they also uh, took care to change the locks in the doors so he shouldn't wow. sneak in and, and, and uh, work over weekends instead of being on holiday. So, uh, so he's, he's, he's out of the picture, but the signal is problematic, I think we can say, that, that the institution which is the one who's that should look after government resources is sort of uh, told to, to, to keep quiet. And of course they decided that his the acting Auditor General was maybe not the most critical person they could found find in the organization. So it's been very quiet ever since. Yes, um, in conclusion, I think it's fair to say that the government has done a very good job in managing the health crisis. Um, 300 deaths is a lot, but, but it could have gone much worse. They, they really did their utmost and, and the, the, uh, the initiatives came quickly and they were bold and, uh, and despite all the pressures from the churches that wanted to reopen and so on, they, they just stayed uh, on course for a very long time uh, until they, they thought it was safe. The economic crisis is deep and it'll take years for the economy to fully recover, but in some, say, five years' time, this is probably something that will be a problem of the past. The reinforcement of unfortunate practices during an election year is, is maybe the, uh, the issue that gives most concern, because this is something that, that is uh, further consolidating a particular way of running elections. Uh, somebody will have earned a lot from, from, from all the money that is flowing around this year. Uh, and it'll be it, it is a challenge to the democratic processes and, and the idea of uh, everybody being uh, able to, to stand up for election uh, regardless of, of their position in society and so on. Um, and, and maybe very much related to that, the suspicion of many people that this is what has taken place and the lack of legitimacy uh, of the government of whichever uh, government will be elected. Uh, that is something that is, is disturbing and uh, undermining the otherwise, I'd say, very beautiful democracy that Ghana has had since 1992, a proud record of seven peaceful uh, and transparent and, and democratic elections since 1992, but more and more uh, being undermined by, by the ro role that money is playing in, in, uh, in the election process. Yes? Thank you very much, Tove. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tove, also for this really interesting and insightful presentation obviously building on a deep insight into Ghana and the dynamics of Ghana currently. Um, I want to immediately just open up to the floor for questions. So uh, to the two speakers. Uh, so does anybody have a question? El Magreda. much both of you unfortunately very depressing uh, situation in Ghana uh, quasi uh, ECOWAS has a history of normally in elections in West African countries playing quite an important role both in the run-up to the election and in monitoring the election you haven't mentioned anything about uh, foreign observers or anything in relation to the elections and the fact that Ghana now presides uh, presides the Ministerial Council of ECOWAS, I take it means that they will not play any role, so there's nobody left because uh, African Union, yes, they might come, but they are normally not that strong. 
I mean, when I think of ECOWAS' role in Mali and how they did all the way back when I was in Liberia and so on, I mean, this presidency of the ECOWAS comes very conveniently for the upcoming election. Just let's take another couple of other questions. There's one in the back. That that gentleman here, and then no, just okay. <laughs> okay, you decide. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. And please um, present yourselves and your okay. name. I'm Alasan Isa Suhini, a PhD student at KU, and I'm from Ghana. Um, I have three questions to find out from uh, from our presenters. Um, to our first presenter, regarding the succession that is currently ongoing in Ghana, there has been the concern that uh, in 1956, they were given a period of 50 years that after the elapse of this period, they can break away from Ghana. I want to find out from your expertise whether this information is true and whether they still, I mean, whether they have that, uh, whether that was actually enshrined in the 1956. Then um, my other concern has been that you mentioned in your presentation that the Electoral Commission of Ghana initially envisaged to register 15 million eligible Ghanaians, but they ended up registering almost 17 million. So my question is, the, this 2020, there has been um, the Ghana, uh, the, the, there will be population and housing census. So couldn't have the EC waited so that um, the population and housing census could have given them the number of, a clue to the number of eligible voters rather than they embarking on the voter registration exercise, which the two main political parties still have issues with. Then my third concern has to do with, uh, in your presentation, you made mention that the president of the republic presented the um, the bill on the um, vigilantism. And the Imre Short Commission uh, recommendations have totally been thrown away, as uh, we and I are aware. So going into the election, do you think Ghanaians will have the trust in our policing uh, um, and I mean in our um, in in the national uh, uh, security uh, uh, apparatus? Mm. Don't you think maybe Ghanaians will still want to take the law into their own hands, given the fact that um, our uh, the incumbent government have actually not gone in line with what the measured Commission recommended going into the 2020 election. I think basically these are the three concerns that I want to. Question Thank you. And I then think. okay, maybe and then we come to you. Maybe we just let the sp both speakers make a make a comment on what's been said already, and then we go to the to the next one. So, Kwesi, maybe you start. Yeah. Yes, and Margaret, uh, thank you very much. Um, I truly doubt if there will be any monitors from ECOWAS. Um, that, that's number one. Number two, in the last three years or so, the quality of leadership coming out of Abuja has been quite poor. Uh, so that ECOWAS is, and of course, of course, the quality of leadership coming out of Addis Ababa also. So it's not just about ECOWAS's failure with respect to Ghana. ECOWAS has failed Likewise, the African Union with respect uh, to Mali. I mean, Mr. Keita, the former president, was just not the nicest man in town, corrupt, you know, a petty thief, uh, basically used state resources as his, you know, personal bank account. We are seeing Mr. Watara in La Côte d'Ivoire now, you know, going to run for a third term, President Talon in Benin you know, who has been criticized by the African Court on People and Human Rights and has actually been taken Benin out of the court process. You know, in all these things, ECOWAS is quiet, African Union is, is quiet. So similar to what you know, Toby has said, I think ECOWAS would look at Ghana's neighbors <laughs> and then say, well, look, it's much better. And of course, we have a, fair, a very smart, convincing people to speak on the foreign policy side. 
you know, sending a clear signal that everything is okay. No, there is no 50-year clause in the, um, in the UN document around the plebiscite. You know, having said that, the agreement around the voting results have always been very contentious. And when people decide, an organized group decides to move from talking to using weapons, then I think every responsible government has a duty to begin a process of listening. Because the geographical expanse of the attack on the 25th, the success of the attack, the slowness of government response, and increasingly the politics around telling the citizenry what really did take place is raising fundamental you know, concerns. And knowing what happens on the sub-region, our own role in funding and supporting wars in West Africa, I have argued very strongly that it may be necessary to start a backdoor channel you know, to listen to what they are talking about, what their concerns are, because it's in our collective interest to ensure this does not escalate. The EC's expectation of 15 million leading close to 17 million. The politics around the need for a new voters register was not so much about the transparency, the inclusiveness of that register and the processes towards holding an election. I think there was this fundamental assumption that people had crossed over from some of Ghana's boundaries in earlier voter registration exercises and had bloated the numbers to 15 million. But this represents, or this misunderstanding, represents a weakness in institutional capacity to understand the demographics and how that could have impacted on the numbers. So for the EC itself to claim that the earlier figures were too high and they could reduce it to 15 million, and now having gone up to 17 million, places the credibility of the EC in some doubt. Trust in the security services. Peter mentioned internal operations. Let me give three examples of the disturbingly dangerous quicksand that the security services find themselves in. Tobe has spoken about the government response to the COVID. It was clear, it was no nonsense, and the troops were brought out onto the streets. Quite a number of us had argued strongly that you have got to securitize the process to ensure that the numbers don't get out of hand because we don't, have the, we don't have the equipment, we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the personnel. And knowing the tensions in the country, it could very easily have gotten out of hand, leading to violence. Now, when the troops came out, there was widespread support, respect, and actually happiness that the, that, that the troops had been uh, brought out. The invincibility around the, the uniform services was actually respected and enhanced. Subsequent to that, three things have happened. One was the role of the uniform serv services during the registration exercise. They've been abused, hooted at, intimidated, confronted by civ uh, civilians. That's one. Two, we are seeing uniform services being used by individuals in high authority for their, for their pecuniary interests. That has resulted in quite a number of cases of uniformed people being arrested, beaten up by civilians and communities, and the state's subsequent response in intimidating them. The final one is just about three weeks ago, the attacks in the Volta region. The security services were slow, Almost eight chiefs 
have come out now publicly to say, oh, but the secessionists came to visit us looking for support. But none of these chiefs reported the matter to the security services. So there's something beginning to change and shift in, a, in a, our re relationship. Be that as it may, the security services in our last interviews came on top in terms of public trust in their ability to protect the sanctity of the state and not the vigilantes. So there are some problems, but the generality of the Ghanaian public still thinks that they, 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 they can play a, a, an important role. Tova? Of course. That's why you're here. One piece of information only. Uh, EU has uh, fortunately agreed to uh, to send election observers to the uh, election in December. First, they said that uh, considering the situation in so many other countries, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and, uh, and there are so many elections this year, 2020, they didn't think it necessary to go to Ghana, but they have decided that they will, and we are very pleased about that. Do you want to comment on some of the other? Okay, you you. <laughs> okay, so um, any additional questions from the from the audience? There was one here, and then Maya after. Hi, Christian Hansen from the University of Copenhagen. Thanks for the very interesting yet a bit depressing uh, presentations from uh, Chrissy and Tove. Uh, I have a question for each of you. Um, for Chrissy, uh, you focused a lot. Uh, obviously on the domestic situation. You did mention also, uh, you, you call it the topography of, uh, of Ghana, right, about the relationship with uh, the neighboring countries. Uh, but could you say, could you put a few more words on uh, how uh, the situation in the neighboring countries, how you see that they could influence uh, the security situation leading up to the uh, election? So that was for, for Kwesi, then for Tove. Um, the development partners uh, in Ghana, uh, and especially, of course, uh, the, 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 the Danish uh, development uh, assistance and, and support. Um, what are the discussions uh, in uh, the face of COVID-19? Are there any ideas or discussions about how things should be done in a different way in a post-COVID situation? Thanks. Let's just also take a question from Maya over here. They're in the dark. <laughs> because she's not raising her hand, not the yellow. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Maya? My name is Maya. I'm from the Danish Defense uh, College. Uh, thank you both for your presentation. Um, I'm interested in the expanded role of uh, the military in internal operations, especially during times of elections. And Kwesi, you've been talking about the police mainly and also uniformed personnel, but could, could you say more about whether we're dealing with changing dynamics compared to previous elections when it comes to, to the armed forces? And also, is it linked mainly to internal uh, political dynamics or has it to do with regional instability, including the threat of, of terrorism in the region? Uh, and also, how does it feed into to the politics uh, of suspicion that we are witnessing currently? Thank you. I think we'll take some responses from the panel and then uh, uh, our two speakers and then the final questions. So maybe Tove starts now because... Uh <laughs> uh, I understand your question, Christian, as, as no, it wasn't... Yeah, it was you who asked uh, about the, the considerations among development partners. Has the COVID-19 situation now uh, made development partners reconsider their strategies, including Denmark, uh, which has been phasing out development, traditional development cooperation for some years. Um, there are a number of development partners uh, who remain, and they had already decided to do so. Um, EU has a huge development cooperation program. Uh, the World Bank is continuing, and they've taken over some of our activities uh, in, in, in the private sector area. Um, there are a number of, of development partners who had already decided to, to, uh, to stay on. We have not considered changing, or I should say, Denmark has not considered changing its strategy in, in Ghana after COVID. Um, there's 
it's still the assessment that that resources are in Ghana, despite now the setback of the COVID situation, compared to so many other countries in Africa, uh, which will need our support much more. Uh, Mali, uh, Burkina Faso, Somalia, etc. Um, compared to to these countries, Ghana. Uh, does have the possibility of getting organized and addressing many of the uh, the issues that we have been helping with before. So the COVID situation in itself has not has not uh, led uh, Denmark to to reconsider the phasing out of the traditional development cooperation. What we've done during the past few years is that we have uh, we have started preparing a continued effort in some key sectors. Um, in, in support to peace and security, for instance, we are supporting the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Center, where El Magrede Lloyd is, uh, is a goodwill ambassador, and, and this is where, where Kwesi is working, of course. Um, we are also supporting other uh, organizations, OneEP, uh, in, in, in peace and security. We are continuing our anti corruption efforts because we consider them both hugely important for, for the country as such, but also uh, as relevant to our business cooperation and our different uh, types of cooperation in the future as they were to the development cooperation. Um, so in, in, in a number of areas, in also including um, continuing the support to, uh, to uh, direct elections at decentralized levels. Uh, that's also uh, based on, on an assessment of, of this being so important to the future political development in Ghana that that uh, it 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 holds the possibility of breaking with the winner takes all approach where either you're in or you're out. We know it from the U.S. and so many other countries also. Two two parties competing and either you're in or you're out. Uh, and while you are out, you can do nothing. If if there were direct elections at decentralized levels where it would be possible for other parties to to uh, take the power uh, and so that we had a coexistence of different political parties, um, we believe that this this would um, maybe over time gradually uh, be be a way of countering some of the other issues that I, I uh, reported. So we're, we're, s we're continuing that kind of support, but not any turning around of the decision of phasing out the traditional development support. Quizzy? Almost any functional democracy, one would have expected the appropriate parliamentary committee to invite those who might have been attending the sitting assemblies to appear before the committee in camera and possibly to take the votes on the floor of, of, of the house. Because one party has an absolute majority, it can basically write. Changing dynamics relates, I think, to the terrorism issue. The armed forces is being used or has been used probably for the past 25 to 30 years. The internal operations sometimes characterized as anti terror operations. But the law establishing the armed forces is that guides the political control. there is a nebulous phrase about using the armed forces for the policies of the state or something of the sort. Very nebulous. That allows the politician to basically issue the orders as and how they want. The changing dynamic that you are talking about until the last couple of years Thank you. 
Caribbean team. Right. That is leading to the hands of the being issued instructions to act in internal operations that are more politically oriented than military or strategic. So if you look at, say, the involvement So in, in the coming years, we will see fairly routine usage of the term. But the doctrine has not changed. Because the defense and interior committees of parliament are not up to speed. We are going to see the military used in internal operations with increasing resistance from the populace. Because the Almost all the cases where the armed forces have joined, either in the peace operation or have been ordered by a very senior person, individually of it or a pecuniary interest, to engage in internal operations that have ended disastrously. Four and a half years ago, Muhammad sent the armed forces to deal with the land case. Two of the army chiefs were killed. Three months ago, one chief, well connected, sent the army to go and deal with another land case, twenty kilometers from Accra. Two of the officers were arrested, tortured by the public, and eventually had to get for their own lives. You know, so we are seeing these shifts and these changes. How do we change the, doc the doctrinal conversations? <coughs> I think it's going to take a lot. Hopefully, Peter will be the process. What? <laughs> no, you, Kwesi, you do it. <laughs> I'll help you. From out of Ghana, <laughs> you cannot be intimidated. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, but, but there needs to be uh, some, you know, sort of um, consistent internal operations. What do we want the army for? And how do they play? Or how should they be? Are we? No streaming, great. It's a very exclusive little group here, so please. Oh, uh, okay. Please don't put it online. Well, we, we, we <laughs> it will go online, Quizzy. That's the plan, because other people can benefit from your wisdom. <laughs> but please, knock yourself out. <laughs> Okay, um, Christian, it's going to get much worse before it, it gets better. Let me start from Mali. You know, ECOWAS has deceived itself that young soldiers have taken over power, that ECOWAS as an institution can order them to hand over power or to bring in a civilian government. ECOWAS doesn't have that credibility and no single head of state has that credibility. So what do the soldiers do? <laughs> they take one of their old friends, a soldier who has served as a former defense minister, and elevates him to the presidency. ECOWAS, a couple of hours ago, 
lifted the sanctions. What hypocrisy. Now, the signal from the Malian soldiers to other West African soldiers is that politicians, if you, you misuse us, we will take the power for, for our own selves. So the signal from Mali, that goes also to Burkina Faso, to La Côte d'Ivoire, and to Benin, is very clear. Now Ghana chairs <coughs> ECOWAS. The Malian soldiers were ordered to come to Accra to appear before the heads of states. Mr. Watara was there, has just changed the constitution and wants to run for a third term. No moral authority. President Talon was also there. My head of state ordered them to go and actually change their uniform. But you see, sometimes we don't understand the symbolism in bodily gestures and in the color of the clothing that people wear. So the symbol to their supporters in Burkina, uh, in Mali, was that, yes, well, we have been told to put down our un uniforms, and now we have put on a nice suit, so we are, we are one of them. After the meeting in Accra, one would have expected Ghanaian security and the diplomatic corps to advise whoever their minders were to take them straight to the airport. They decided to do a detour and to visit Mr. Rolex, <laughs> the single most popular former head of state in West Africa, dashing anti-corrupt campaigner. And he basically told this young, impressionable man, you know, democracy has not contributed to the corruption fight. A signal to them, go home, get somebody to sit in front of you, and then pull, pull the uh, strings. So the calculus from Accra is at best very dubious. And herein lies the question that you were, you were uh, uh, asking. I've traveled around the whole of the north. There are no borders and very little control. When you take the boundary with La Côte d'Ivoire, from uh, uh, Bole all the way down to Bandanquanta. I hope there was a map here. All those mines, small mines, are run by former rebel groups from Burkina Faso, Mali, Nigeria, and La Côte d'Ivoire. So the geographical space that we occupy is being impinged upon by multiple powerful forces. We've become an, uh, become an entry port for the smuggling of a, a, a rosewood, okay? And that is not just some small fry, no. These are those who matter in the Forestry Commission. Smuggling this, China alone in the last 10 years has bought six million individual rosewood trees. Now, this is not some little village chief who can do this. There's got to be collusion somewhere in terms of export licenses, all those things. So beneath the veneer of a functional, stable, responsive state are also the beginnings of how our own corrupt you know, practices institutional inefficacies are feeding into the wider, you know, sub-regional challenges that we, we are, are facing. Burkina Faso, I don't know, probably Toby can speak to this. It may not take too long before Wangadugu itself is uh, taken. Between now and the Ivorian elections, I'm not too sure. But certainly, if Watara wins, La, La Côte d'Ivoire is going to face quite some difficulty. Togo has had a successful election. But the extremists who have been trained both in Yemen and Saudi Arabia will never accept those elections. It's only a matter of time. They will come back much stronger, more better organized, and for nothing, is not going to have it easy. So for the next year, two years, I think the architecture of stability that has been woven together in the aftermath of Charles Taylor and uh, for the Sankor is beginning 
to be threatened both from the outside but even more disturbingly from the inside. Thank you, Quizzy. I think I want to stop here and uh, just briefly say before I thank our, our, our s uh, panel uh, members that Quizzy and I are doing a report while he's here in, 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 in Copenhagen looking at all the big challenges of West Africa uh, currently. Uh, all of them, that sounds very bold, but some of them and in some depth as well. And it's based on a lot of conversations with Quizzy over the last uh, month and continue to, to talk to him <laughs> about these issues over the next month. Uh, and the report will be out in, uh, in, um, in early 2021. But we are expecting to do a s another seminar looking more broadly at West Africa from the Mediterranean to the West Coast uh, in November and uh, we will send out more information about that but uh, just for you to let for you to know what's in store of great things but for now I want to thank uh, Tove Deinbol for coming and talking on on the basis of her many years in Ghana. And Kwesi has also been on many years in Ghana. So thank you also, Kwesi, for coming here and talk today. And uh, thank you to you guys as well for coming uh, in these COVID-19 uh, times. So thank you. <laughs> and there is a COVID-19 friendly drink uh, outside. So please go and uh, Kwesi and Tove will also stay behind, I hope, to just talk to those of you who stay behind. So thank you. <laughs>